Jesus, in this passage, was near the end of the road. As Jericho was only 15 miles away from Jerusalem, he was on his way to celebrate the Passover. That was mandated that every Jewish male over 12 years old within a 15 mile radius had to attend. Jericho was the thoroughfare to Jerusalem. And in those days and in those times, it was commonplace for any rabbi or distinguished teacher on their way to Passover would be surrounded by a crowd of people. They would be teaching and the people would be asking questions and they would teach as they walked. It would also be commonplace for those not making the pilgrimage, they would line the streets listening intently, getting at least a little bit of what the rabbis and the teachers would teach. This is where we find Bartimaeus this morning, begging for anything someone might offer, hoping that someone would notice him. There were no food stamps. Social services, welfare. He was at the mercy of others. He was alone and cast aside. As I read and reread this passage this week, I had to ask myself, as I hope you do also, in my life, have I ever cried out? Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, God. Anyone. Have mercy on me. Have you ever yelled that? Felt it? I see it many times in nursing homes. where I'll walk through the nursing home and there will be people in their wheelchairs, alone, confused, saying something, reaching out. And I often wonder, are they saying, have mercy on me? Maybe you've experienced it late at night, when the mind gets erasing, when we can't shut it off, when the worries of our world, <coughs> our schedules seem overwhelming, and the only rebuttal we have in that moment is, Lord, have mercy. I need some rest. Maybe you shouted those words at the bedside of a loved one, gravely ill, and said them again shortly thereafter at the graveside prayers. My premise this morning is this. My single message is this. We are Bartimaeus, my friends. And today we have a gift. A gift of self-examination of how we are Bartimaeus. It's my only point. If you leave here motivated to examine your heart, I'd be thrilled. Because I know there are some here this morning who feel like they are sitting on the side of the road yelling, Lord, have mercy on me. I know that there are some among us this morning who are wondering what road they're even on. And, and, and does this road ever end? I believe we are more like Bartimaeus than we would like to believe. So I want to take a moment before the anthem to look at the story of Bartimaeus. 
and see what was it in the story that brought him restoration, that brought healing about on that road that we might be able to use on the journeys of our life. A few things I'd like you to consider. First, I was struck in my study this week that when Jesus hears him and calls him forward, it says that Bartimaeus threw his coat aside. Now, don't miss that meaning. Now, some translations call it a garment, a cloak. But Bartimaeus <coughs> was told to get up. He threw his coat aside and went to Jesus. That may have been his only possession. Think about that. He didn't have a lot that was weighing him down, hindering him in responding to the call of Jesus. All he had was the coat. He relinquished it and went to Jesus. All week long I've been thinking the layers that I wear on my heart that keep me from Jesus. The many coats each of us have that keep us from responding to the call of Jesus. So like the children, this is a time of self-reflection. To identify those areas in our life, we must cast aside. That are a detriment to our wholeness and our healing. Do you have any? I've got a closet full of them. Do you need help identifying them this morning? Those layers that keep us estranged from Jesus. Let me help you along. Is it our materialism? Our apathy? Our cynicism? Is it our anger, our fear, or maybe it's our sophistication? That keeps us from Jesus. Is it our self-loathing? Our pride, our regrets, our stinking, thinking attitudes? Or our inability to forgive? Maybe there's too many layers to identify. That's probably my case. But identify them we must. What layers must we shed to run to Jesus this morning? Second thing I'd like you to entertain is that Bartimaeus, he had a heart. He had a faith, we're told. Your faith has made you well. He had a heart that, as I see it, overcame a bad theology. His mind. His heart overcame his mind. Now, this is a double-edged blessing. Please travel with me on this one. Bartimaeus yells out, Jesus, Son of God. Now, as William Barclay points out, this is a very inaccurate perception of Jesus based on the messianic conquering king that would make Israel great again. But I see this as a lesson as to how a faithful heart can sometimes overcome an underdeveloped theology. Jesus never asks us in Scripture, understand me completely. Then he'll open the gates of heaven. But rather, he shares time and time again examples to have faith in those things that we do not understand about him. For example, how in the world can an infinite God, the God that created everything, I have a confession. This was the point of my sermon. I was going to pause and I was going to hit you with statistics that would make your hair on your neck stand up about the galaxy, the billions of stars, and how we're just a little piece of dust in the midst of all of that. I'll spare you. But I think you get the idea. 
that how in the world can this infinite creator God love a finite beggar like me? Like you? As disciples of Jesus, here's the good news, however. The good news is that we can integrate both our heart, our faith, and our mind and our theology. I remember Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick reminds us, and I'll quote him, the more you know about something, the more you think about the individual. I'll repeat that. The more you know about something, the more you think about the individual. Let me give you some examples. The library. An illiterate person unable to read can enter the library and look around and be in awe of all of the books, the volume of books, the catalogs. But it doesn't go much beyond that until that person then sees someone behind a desk they're called the librarian. Who knows everything about that library? That librarian will know where the books are, what kind of books are where, knows all about the catalogs, everything. And if you ask a question of that librarian, you almost certainly, you can find that here. You see, the more you know, the more the librarian knows, the more they can deal with individual needs. Give me another example. I want you to think, the person in your life who knows the least about auto mechanics, and then subtract one. <laughs> That's me. I know nothing. I'm, you know, when I say nothing, I can add my windshield washer fluid and I can check the tire pressure. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, on those times when I had car problems, I do what everyone else does. You pull off to the side of the road, put your four ways on, you pop the hood. <laughs> connected to what? But an auto mechanic can. I get a guy. And because that mechanic knows that this is connected to that, because that's this, this is this way, I'll fix it for you, Mark. Praise God. <laughs> the mechanic knows so much more than I do because they have learned it and contend to the needs of the individual. It's the same with theology. How in the world can this mysterious unknown God at times to us, how do we move towards a personal relationship? The creator of everything is our friend. Loves you and loves me. And I'm here to say that the more we jump into that mystery, the more that we learn, the more that we uncover a truth, the closer our relationship is with Jesus. What needs to be cast aside, my friends? How and what can we do to learn more about developing intimacy with Jesus? But finally, I want to take you to the final words Jesus has, or one of the final words Jesus has to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus hears Jesus, yells to him. Jesus stops, says, come here. Bartimaeus casts his coat and runs to Jesus. And then Jesus asks this, do you remember the question he asks? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Notice that Jesus did not preach, did not prophesy, did not debate or belittle. He healed. 
My takeaway from that, friends, is this. There are spiritual blessings in specificity. There are spiritual blessings in specificity. There is enlightenment in life in the definite. Let me give you a few examples. Endowments to churches often kills churches. It's been said that eight out of ten churches who receive large endowments die. And the reason for that, as I understand it, is the church never thought about how they would use that money to build the kingdom of God. And so when that money comes and is dumped upon them, the leaders sit around tables arguing about how to use that money. Relationships become fractured. The money is spent silly in silly ways. And oftentimes it's a matter of time. How about here? If we were blessed, if we were blessed with an endowment, could every one of us within five seconds say, oh yeah, this is what we would use it for because we talked about it. We're ready to go. We know that God in building the kingdom is leading us here and boy, that would be a blessing. I don't think that's our reality. But I do believe that your leadership will be leading us into that reality this year and into the next. Specificity. You see, often we know what we don't want, but never clearly define what we do want and then complain when it doesn't show up. That's lunacy. I know what I don't want. I don't define really what I want and then it doesn't show up and we get frustrated. One of the neatest books on relationships, marital relationships, I know that it's blessed Lynn and I, is a book that's entitled His Needs, Her Needs, and the author is Willard Harley. And the whole crux of the book is about asking that question to each other. What do you need from me? To directly ask our spouses, what do you need from me? I end this. I think we have been given a gift this morning. A gift of self-reflection. So as we go and move into a new week, let's ask some questions. What do I need to let go of? What needs to go? What's prohibiting me because I'm wearing it from being closer to Jesus? Identify that. Secondly, what might I learn that will foster a deeper relationship with Jesus? And finally, am I willing to ask Jesus on purpose with specificity what I need to be the man and the woman Jesus calls me to be? Let us pray. Holy and wonderful God, we thank you for this gift you have given us. This gift to reflect. This gift to become. We are Bartimaeus. We are that blind beggar along the road, Lord God, and we cry for mercy. <laughs> Enable us to shed what we must, learn what we have to, and ask for what is needed to be your disciple today, tomorrow, and forever, we pray in your holy name. Amen.